Um, I used to hang out in a tattoo shop in downtown Mobile on Royal Street. And one time I was there, and a young man came in not to get a tattoo, but to get one covered up. You see, he had gotten a tattoo of a Chinese symbol that he thought meant family. But unfortunately, after making friends with someone that understood Chinese, he found out that it didn't say family. It said something to the effect of, my affection is for sale. Not the same thing at all. When I was in ninth grade, I got to go on a mission trip to Monterey, Mexico. And being that none of us spoke Spanish, we had some translators that taught us phrases to say to interact with the people we came in contact with. One night, we were going to do a big worship service in the middle of a town square, and so we split up into groups of three or four, and we were going around, and we were inviting people with this phrase that we had been taught to come and worship with us. And I remember the, the group of, that I was in, the group of four, we came in contact with this mother with two young children, and very eagerly, one of the men stepped forward, and he said that phrase that we had been taught. And she looked horrified. And she grabbed her children, and she threw them behind her to block our path. And we were very confused. And she was very confused. And so we flagged down one of our translators, and the translator came over, and unfortunately, the man that stepped forward had misspoken. He had messed up that phrase that he had been given. Instead of saying, please come with us to worship, he had said something like, give us your children. (laughs) Not the same thing. The mother did not react very well to that, as you can imagine. Church, sometimes we get the meaning of words wrong. And sometimes that even happens in the church. And when it happens, the results can be just as catastrophic. Did you know that all 37 books of the Old Testament were written in the Hebrew language? And in Hebrew, there's no word for spiritual. There's no word for spiritual. The dictionary defines spiritual as relating to or affecting the human spirit or soul as opposed to material or physical things. And this morning, I wonder if sometimes we as Christians might get our definition of what qualifies as spiritual more from Merriam-Webster than we do from God's Word or from Jesus, the Word became flesh himself. In my time as a pastor, in my ministry, as I've walked alongside students and parents and friends who are trying to work out their salvation, more times than I can count, I've asked someone, how are you doing? And I've gotten a response that sounds like this. I'm doing okay. Work's going all right. Family's good. I'm really struggling spiritually, though. Or, man, life is good, I'm kind of stagnant spiritually right now, but I'm okay. Or, I'm having a hard time with my spiritual life, but other than that, I'm doing pretty well. Church, what responses like these imply is that we have a spiritual life involving our walk with Jesus, our faith in God, our church attendance, our time spent in prayer, our study of God's word, and then this other separate life involving our jobs, our finances, our relationships, our hobbies, our responsibilities, and everything else. When we use this language, when our lives flow out of this perspective, what we're admitting, whether we realize it or not, is that we are attempting to silo off our faith, isolating it into what we call our spiritual lives, separate and unencumbered by the rest of what's going on around us and inside of us. Students, parents, church, I'm here to tell you this morning, you may be more comfortable trying to cram Jesus into a box labeled spiritual life, but he don't fit. Too often, we try to relegate Jesus to the guest room of our lives, forgetting that his father owns the deed to the house. This idea that we have a spiritual life and a life separate from that that is spiritual is Merriam-Webster. It's not Bible, and it's not Jesus. In fact, it goes against everything that Jesus taught in his life and his ministry. In the Old Testament, God's people weren't practicing their faith as a momentary escape once a week from a broken and evil world, but I think sometimes maybe, maybe we do. They didn't divide their lives into spiritual and secular. 
But I think if we're honest, maybe sometimes we do. You see, they had no conception of spiritual life and also leading another life simultaneously that was entirely disconnected from their spirituality. And folks, neither did Jesus. From the outset of his ministry, Jesus invited people to repent, to turn away from that which bound them and held them captive, and instead to turn toward the God of freedom. Jesus asked people to repent because he said the kingdom of God is at hand. Meaning that God's kingdom wasn't located in a temple built built by human hands. Meaning that God's kingdom wasn't only accessible when you die and go to heaven. Meaning that God's kingdom wasn't relegated to a worship experience once a week. But that God's kingdom was being established in the hearts of people. And existed in his presence as a new reality anywhere and everywhere for anyone who decides to put their trust and their hope in the Lord. When Jesus called his disciples, he invited them to come and to follow him. To leave everything behind. Their jobs, their families, their sense of security, their normalcy. To leave it all. To travel with him. To eat with him. To learn from him. To feed the hungry and heal the sick. To bless the children. To care for the orphans and widows. In John 14, Jesus emphatically declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What he's saying when he says that, when he says that no one comes to the Father except through me, he says that true life, that life abundant, can only be found in him. That outside of Jesus, there is no life. And when Jesus died on the cross, taking our place, the veil in the temple that separated the people from the holy of holies, the place where the Spirit of God dwelled in fullness, that veil was torn. It was ripped in half, signifying that no longer would the people of God be separated from His presence, but that anyone and everyone has access to the Father. The dictionary might tell us that that which is spiritual is relating to or affecting the human spirit or soul as, a, as opposed to material or physical things. But Jesus, Jesus tells us that he is life. Jesus tells us that God's kingdom and presence are all around us. That everything we do is spiritual. So it's not, oh, I'm struggling in my spiritual life, but other than that, I'm pretty well. There is no other than that. You're not struggling with your spiritual life. You're struggling in your spirit. You're struggling with life. Through his words and his ministry and his example, Jesus shows us that every aspect of our lives matters immensely. And all of it should be brought under the lordship of Jesus. According to Jesus, a life is possible where nothing is insignificant, where nothing is wasted. According to Jesus, God isn't only concerned with how often we pray and whether or not we're filling a pew on Sundays or how much we put in the collection plate. But he's just as concerned with how we speak to our children, with our attitudes at work on Monday morning, or when we're walking the halls of our campus, with how forgiving we are with our neighbors, with how hospitable we are to foreigners, to immigrants, and to the poor, with where we go and what we do, with how we spend our time, our energy, our money, our efforts, and even with the load of laundry on your couch or the dirty dishes waiting to be washed in your sink. It all matters to God. It's not that we have a spiritual life and then everything else. It's that all of our lives, every part, is spiritual. That's why in Romans 12, 2, the Apostle Paul instructs us as believers to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and says that this is our true act of worship, because church worship isn't meant to be relegated to three hymns that we sing on a Sunday morning. Worship isn't supposed to be relegated to some rote religious practices. Worship is supposed to be a posture that we develop towards God in which we say, God, your ways are higher than my ways. And God, your understanding is better than my understanding. So in every aspect of my life, it's not my will that's going to be done, but it's yours. God, you are in charge because you know what's best for me. 
So where you send me, I will go. And the words that you give me, I will speak. And the people that you put in front of me, I will love. And the things that you give me to do, I will do to the best of my abilities in such a way that point people back to you. It's coming to an understanding that as rapper Lecrae says in his song, your money, your singleness, your marriage, your talents, your time, they were all loaned to you by God to show the world that Christ is divine. Church, it's not just that you have a soul that will one day leave your body and float off into heaven. It's that you are a soul. Mind, body, spirit, right here, right now. And the way you live your life every day, day in and day out, can either help people get a taste of what heaven will be like, or it can leave people in their own personal hell. I hope this morning you're hearing that it's not that some segments of your life are matters of faith and others aren't, but it's a question of how faithful you're willing to be in each aspect of your life. God wants the whole of who you are. All that you do. There's a quote that I'm sure you've heard before. It goes like this. In your life, either Jesus is Lord of all or not Lord at all. In your life, either Jesus is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Which one is it going to be? Because Jesus isn't interested in taking up residence in the guest room of our lives, invited out when it's convenient for us or when we need something from him but left alone otherwise. He wants the deed to the house. Abraham Lincoln famously said that a house divided against itself cannot what? Cannot stand. Yet too often we work so hard to divide the house of our lives into what we're comfortable with handing over to God, and what we want to hold back and keep to ourselves and remain in control of. And then we wonder, when adversity hits, why we cannot stand. It's because we have divided ourselves. It's almost like sometimes we keep Jesus riding shotgun, and we're the ones behind the wheel, and yet we want to blame him For all the wrong turns that we make. Everything we do is spiritual. It all matters to God. Since we know this, since we know this is true, there's a couple things we must understand about this knowledge. And the first is that it is a responsibility. It's a responsibility. If the kingdom of God is at hand, if Jesus invites us to leave everything to follow him, if there's nowhere that we can go to escape the presence of God, if God never leaves us or forsakes us or gives up on us, if everything we do is spiritual and matters to God, if God wants not just a part of us but our whole selves so that he can put back together all the broken pieces, so that he can remake us in his image, So that we can become the people we are created to be and be sent out into the mission field of the world with the only good news that can bring the dead to life. If we believe that to be true, if we earnestly believe it, it's a responsibility, isn't it? It means that we have a responsibility. It's a responsibility because this faith is not a sprint, but it's a marathon. We've learned that this last year, haven't we? It's a responsibility because... Teenagers, you may graduate from high school, but you never graduate from your faith. It's a responsibility because, church, you might retire from your career, but you never retire from following Jesus actively. It's a responsibility because we may clock out from work on Friday, but on Monday morning we shouldn't be clocking out of our faith. We have the responsibility of running our race. Even when times are hard, even in seasons of doubt and busyness, even when we're tired and we're stressed, there will be times that we're just not feeling it. There will be times when we doubt our ability to finish the race, but it's our responsibility to keep putting one foot in front of the other, to put our hope in Christ alone, to pursue God, to keep running the race that's been set before us, and to continue to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And it's also our responsibility to respond to the resurrection of Jesus by giving him our whole lives. 
our whole lives, our whole selves, not just a part, not just some, but the whole thing. To ensure that we don't try and silo off our faith, that we don't try to squeeze God into a box that could never contain Him, but instead to make sure that we allow God access to and control over every corner of our lives so that He can provide the wholeness and the healing and the restoration that He promises in His Word. If everything we do is spiritual and all matters to God, we have a responsibility. But it's not just a responsibility, though. It's also a freedom. And I want you to hear this. This is good news. It's also a freedom. Earlier, I shared with you that the Hebrew language that the Old Testament was written in does not have a word for spiritual. But the New Testament was written in Greek. And there is a word in Greek for spiritual. And it's the word pneumaticos. Pneumaticos. And what it literally means when translated is animated by the Spirit of God. Isn't that beautiful? Animated by the Spirit of God. Colossians 3.23 tells us, Whatever you do, do unto the Lord. This verse is speaking specifically about our response to those who have power over us. So I don't think it's a leap to apply it to our faith in God who has power over the entire universe. Everything you do. Everything you do, do as if unto the Lord. Essentially, what this verse is asking us to do is to live a life of pneumaticos. A life that is animated by the Spirit of God. A life in which everything we do is spiritual. And this is good news because what this life looks like when lived out is it looks like a life of freedom. It looks like a life that flows out of true freedom that can only be found in Christ. What this means is that we can live a life where nothing is wasted. No pain is wasted. Because it can serve as a mighty testimony to the faithfulness of God. No struggle is wasted. Because it can teach you to rely fully on the provision of God. A life in which your everyday routine tasks aren't meaningless, but in which they truly matter. You aren't just washing bottles, which is what I was doing last night, but you're exemplifying the love of God by caring for the little one that he's entrusted you with. You aren't just studying for a test, students, but you're working diligently to take full advantage of the opportunity God has provided for you to get an education. You aren't just working a job but you're serving as a missionary at the outpost that God has placed you. And you're earning a living to take care of those around you who are in need. You aren't just playing in the band or singing in the choir or playing on your sports team, but you're using your talents and your gifts and your passions to build community with others and to connect with them on a personal level. And you're not just going to lunch with a friend. You're being given a chance to encourage to pour into, and to listen to another person who is also made in the very image of God. A life of pneumaticos is a life of freedom in which everything matters. Nothing is frivolous, but your life is teeming and is full of purpose. It's a life that isn't stale, but is full of newness and full of adventure. And it isn't a cookie-cutter life either because it looks different for all of us. God has gifted each of us with a different personality, with different passions and hobbies and giftings and dreams. And because everything we do is spiritual and everything matters to God, we have the freedom to pursue those passions and dreams and to use those gifts for God's glory. God doesn't want you to surrender your life to Him so that He can strip you of who you are. God wants you to surrender your life to Him so that you can become the person that you were created to be. God wants to make you the most you that you have ever been. God wants to free you from all the hurts and habits and hang-ups that trip you up and that keep you from living a life abundant. A friend of mine's wife is a very talented writer, and she put it this way. She said, if God's presence is like water... 
than I want to serve. I've lounged too long on the sand. You can read books about surfing or about life with God all day, but it isn't the same as feeling that surge of power lift your body into the air. Admiring a wave isn't the same as merging with it, surrendering, and let it take you wherever it may. I want to ride the waves. I want to be drenched in his power. I want to scream in terror at the swell behind me. Maybe I'll get a little beaten up when I fight the currents, when I slip out of sync with the tide. So be it. If it's a part of learning to move with God's currents, then count me in. Church, everything we do is spiritual. It all matters to God. That's what it means to live a spiritual life. So this morning, I want to ask you, how are you handling the responsibilities? Are you continuing to run the race that's been marked out for you, or have you gotten weary and tired, and are you sitting on the sidelines instead? Are you placing all of your life in God's hands and trusting Him to make something beautiful out of it, or are you holding back so that you can remain in control? Are you living out of the freedom that you have in Jesus? Does your life flow out of the freedom that you have in Jesus, the freedom that comes from being connected to the very source of life, the freedom that comes from being filled with the same power that raised Jesus from the grave? Are you reading books? Are you reading books about and admiring the waves from the beach? Or are you ready to surf? We're going to sing a closing hymn, and during that time, if God has moved in your heart or in your mind as we've shared his word together, I invite you to respond to the Lord. You can do that by coming to this altar rail and praying. You can do that by making your seat an altar and praying right where you are. But don't leave this place today without having a conversation about God, without allowing him to meet you right where you are, without surrendering your life to him.